Today we are gonna talk about genu verum, commonly known as bow legs. You have probably seen a toddler whose legs curved outward, almost like a cowboy who just got off a horse. Sometimes it's cute, sometimes it's worrying, but as you'll see today, not all bow legs are created equal. What is genu verum? Genu verum is a deformity of the lateral limbs where the knees remain apart when the ankles are together, creating a bow shaped appearance. If you imagine drawing a straight line from the hip to the ankle, in genu verum that line falls inside a knee joint, meaning the legs curve outward. Here is an important fact. Most newborns are bow-legged. Why? Because in the womb they are curled up with their legs folded, so they are born with a natural varus alignment. Some 100% of infants at birth have genu verum because it is physiological and is gradually resolved by age 2 or 3 years. By 3 to 4 years, many children develop the opposite genio valgum or knock knees before finally reaching a natural alignment by about 7 to 8 years. So in toddlers under 2, bow legs are usually harmless and normal. But persistent, severe or worsening bow legs after age 2 is when we start thinking about pathological causes. So we divide this disorder into physiological and pathological. Physiological is when it's seen in infants and toddlers under 2 years and also is symmetrical, painless, and self-correcting. But when the deformity is asymmetrical, progressive, painful, or persisting after age 2 or 3, we consider this as a pathological genu varum. There are several reasons for pathological genu varum. The most common is a disease called rickets that is caused by vitamin D deficiency and it usually leads to imperfect calcification and soft bones that can finally result in bow legs. Balloon's disease or abnormal growth of the medial part of the proximal tibia is another cause of genu varum. It can be early onset in infants or late onset in adolescents and is often linked to obesity. Bone dysplasia, infections, trauma like tibial fracture and other less common causes like bone metabolism disorders can lead to genu varum as well. When we talk about the symptoms of genu varum, what strikes us first is not pain or disability, but the look. Parents usually notice that their child's leg curve outward like tiny bows, leaving a clear space between the knees even when the ankles are touching. It's often most obvious when the child is standing or walking. Most children with physiological genu varum run, play, and climb without any discomfort, so the deformity itself, not pain, is what brings them to the clinic. But when genu varum is due to a pathological cause, the picture changes. The curve may become asymmetrical, one leg bending more than the other, or it may worsen instead of improving with age. Some children may develop an unsteady, waddling gait, stumble more often, or complain of knee and leg pain after activity. In severe or neglected cases, the misalignment can put uneven stress on the joints, leading to early fatigue, difficulty running, and even long-term risk of arthritis. So while genu varum may look harmless at first glance, its symptoms tell a deeper story. From being a simple cosmetic variation in toddlers to becoming a styling architect of joint problems if left unchecked. Diagnosing genu varum is really about looking with a sharp eye and thinking with a structured mind. The first clue comes from the history. How old is the child? Did the bowing appear early and is it improving with growth or is it getting worse with time? Then comes the physical exam. We stand the child upright, bring the ankles together and measure the intercondylar distance or the gap between the knees. In a physiological case, the bowing is usually symmetrical, gentle and painless. But if one leg bends more than the other or the deformity is sharp and progressive, alarms start ringing. The gait is carefully observed does the child walk normally, or is there a waddle, limp, or instability? If suspicion remains, we move to imaging. Plain x-rays of the lateral limbs tell the hidden story. In rickets, we see widened, copped, and frayed gross plates. In balloon's disease, the classic beaking of the medial tibial metaphysis stands out. So the diagnosis of genu varum isn't just about spotting bent legs. It's a journey from observation to measurement to imaging piecing together whether this is simply nature's curve or a signal of disease that needs intervention. Finally, when we have come to the definitive diagnosis of genu varum, it's when we decide whether to simply let nature do its job or to step in with medical help. In most toddlers, the best treatment is actually no treatment at all. 
just reassurance for worried parents and regular follow-up because the leg is naturally straightened with growth. But when the boy is due to disease or doesn't improve with age, that's when our role becomes crucial. If the cause is recurs, the treatment is simple yet powerful, correct the vitamin D and calcium deficiency, and the bones usually remodel beautifully. In balloon's disease, especially in young children, bracing with orthosis can guide the tibia back into alignment. But in more advanced or older cases, we often need surgery. Surgical options include guided growth, where we cleverly tether one side of the growth plate to let the other side catch up, or an osteotomy, where we realign the bone mechanically. The key is timing, treat early and the results are excellent. Wait too long and the child may face permanent deformity and early arthritis. So the treatment of genuvarum is not a one-size-fits-all plan. It's a careful balance of patience, correction, and sometimes surgical precision, always aiming for a strong, straight leg and a healthy gait into adulthood. After a successful treatment of genuvarum, it's necessary to follow up the patient. Following up a child with genuvarum is like watching a story unfold over time. And the ending depends on how closely we keep an eye on it. For physiological cases, the job is mainly reassurance, but reassurance doesn't mean neglect. This children needs to be re-examined every 6 to 12 months, checking whether the bone is softening, staying the same, or getting worse. We measure the intercondylar distance, observing the gait, and compare symmetry between the two legs at each visit. If improvement is clear, we simply continue to monitor until the legs reach a natural alignment, usually by the age of 7 or 8. But if the bowing is progressive, asymmetric, or associated with pain, follow-up becomes the gatekeeper that pushes up toward further imaging or intervention. After medical or surgical treatment, whether for rickets, balloon's disease, or osteotomic correction, follow-up is even more crucial. We monitor healing of the bone, watch for reassurance, and ensure growth plates are behaving as expected, and ensure growth plates are behaving as expected until the skeletal maturity. In other words, follow-up is not a passive waiting game. It's an active, vigilant process guiding us to step back when nature is winning or step in when disease is taking control.